that. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to be talking with you about the psychology of persuasion uh, in an online context. Uh, we're going to look at the metaphorical three systems brain, which comprises the primal, emotional, and rational motivation systems, and then I have a community-ish case study so that you can figure out how certain companies are applying these principles to engage their members on their websites. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay, so if at any point I'm using slight words that just don't make sense, interrupt me, I will happily field questions. I'm going to have a room for five, five minutes at the end or so. Okay, quick introduction. That's me. You can tweet to me. I'm a very strong Twitter person. Um, that's the book. These are the people I worked with. And in 2011, I coined the term word psychology and defined it as the empirical study of how our online environments, that's things like websites, apps, uh, social platforms, emails, anything basically that you find online, how all of these environments influence our behaviors and our attitudes. And the reason that it's useful is because it provides like a psychological toolkit that you can use to help you design more persuasive apps and ex experiences and websites. The reason that I came up with the term, um, it wasn't just a branding exercise, but it was mainly because there is so much amazing research that's being done across all of these disparate fields. So you've got things like neuroscience, persuasive technology, we've already heard DJ Fogg mention this morning, personality psychology, you've got HCI, cross-cultural, it just, the list goes on and on, but no one was really providing a roadmap to bring all these things together to help you understand how you might be able to use this kind of insight. Ultimately, Engaging people online and using web psychology to do that works because it looks at three different levels of psychological context for the people that you are trying to reach. The first is universal. We heard from Robin earlier today about the sense of wanting to belong, social validation. That's true of anyone, whatever gender, age, ethnicity, etc. The second level is a cultural psychological context. So, all of you who are from the States, how are you from the States? From New York? Okay, from Europe? All right, so within this room, we already have about four or five macro-cultural uh, pockets, if you like. Within organizations, you also get this. Um, you also get it in towns. So like in London, you've got north of the river versus south of the river. And the ones north that go south because they say you're a different breed. So these sort of cultural sort of traits will inform the way that we expect people to relate with us and the way that we expect to form connections. Is this blowing what? Is that your mind popping? I'll try not to pop as much. Okay. The third layer, third layer is individual differences. So things like personality research, age, and gender, which is very, very interesting. One of your amazing exports from the US is this amazing biological anthropologist called Helen Fisher, who looks at neurochemical bases for personality differences. So things like um, those of us who are sitting at the front of the stage uh, tend to, according to that research by Sam Gosling, who's a professor of psych at um, Austin University of Texas, People at the front are likely to score more highly for extroversion. And I noticed this when I brought it on my friends, and I suspect that he is less of an extrovert than I am. He's like, what are you doing sitting at the front? I want to sit at the back near an exit. Like, you didn't say that bit, I'm just paraphrasing. But it's the same reason why on a plane you might sit nearest the aisle next to the exit, so shit hits the fan, you can get out quickly and not die. Anyway, um, so with all the research that I did, I found that there are really three key secrets to online success. The first, know who you're targeting understand the psychological context of the people you're trying to reach. So, universal, cultural, individual. Once you understand their psychography, you can then begin to communicate more persuasively. Um, and one of the things that this involves is, of course, things like verbal communication, where you're mirroring exact language so people feel heard. I've recently realized that um, in marketing sectors, people will say leads instead of conversions. I spend a lot of time in conversion optimization. If you say conversions to marketers, they'll think you're talking about some religious experience. It doesn't mean the same thing at all. And so even though you're talking about sales, the language you use to describe that exact same thing will mean different things to different people. So very language is important. Very body language is also important. Physical things like clothing. The second aspect to communicating persuasively is, of course, tailoring the message you have to the medium or channel to make it more accessible. So the message that you, that you send out on Twitter might be phrased or packaged a different way that it would be on LinkedIn, for instance. The third and final secret to being successful online is the ability to understand how to apply psychological persuasion techniques to sell with integrity. Now, this final point is really important. One of the weirdest and most difficult conversations to have when you're talking about persuasion is around ethics. 
how to ensure that you're not screwing someone over or being manipulative or being coercive without, also, you know, when you're trying to use these sorts of principles. Well, I once interviewed Robert Reed over there, and I asked him the same question. And essentially, what I found in my work, the conversation that we had kind of speared all of this, is that if you have a, a mutual positive intent, so the people that you're trying to help, they're going to end up coming out better, but you're applying those techniques as well as you coming out. So it's like win-win. That's an ethical use of persuasion techniques. Okay, so let's launch into the three systems of brain. I'm going to go through this fairly swiftly. These slides are available on SlideShare, so I don't feel like you have to scribble those in those. So the brain is very complex. It's based on this idea of a triune brain, where people say, oh, you've got the, uh, the lizard brain, then you have the mammalian brain, and the neocortex, which is all blast. The brain is much too complex to be reduced to these simplistic terms, but it provides a really useful model for understanding the motivations that initiate behaviors online. And these are usually subconscious. And that enables us to design more persuasive experiences if we can understand these principles. So the primal system, emotional, and rational. So first, the primal. Thought that the primal is common to all animals, looks after your basic vital functions, like your breathing, your heart rate, your digestion, that allows you to assess whether things in your environment are risky or safe for free fight and flight response. It is also the thing that allows you to recognize opportunities for sex and for food in your environment. Online, the cues for sex that we look for, I'm not talking about porn here, which is a whole other conversation, but things like that include weird stuff like symmetry. Now, symmetry is a cue for sexual fitness when you're choosing a mate. The weird thing is, when you give people these images, the one on the left is the original, people will almost always, about 95% of people that you show this to, will almost always prefer the symmetrical face in the middle or on the right. But it doesn't just stop there. On websites, we prefer images and designs that are balanced. We prefer symmetrical geometric shapes. We prefer symmetrical um, art pieces, whether that's a landscape, whatever it might be. So it kind of maps out onto all these different environments. Images of food, I don't know how many of you see an Instagram app, like hashtag food porn is the biggest used hashtag you get, which is why websites like this that don't just show hampers, which is the product they're trying to sell, but they create an environment that feels seductive. It's why it is so seductive. Motion is the reason that gifts work. It picks up on your peripheral vision, and it makes it very hard to not look at. Contrast and concrete messages. When you're trying to engage primal systems in the brain, You've got to lose the abstract terms, the kind of all the acronyms and all that stuff. It just will not work. You need to make the message really hit home, make it tangible. What is this advert showing? What do you think? Vacuum. Vacuum? And what does it tell you about this vacuum? It'll suck out all the wrinkles. It'll suck out all the wrinkles. But <laughs> right, vacuum, when was the last time you vacuumed? Well, maybe you do vacuum your dog, but I have a dog. But if you've got a cute thing, it's a dog, you go, oh, cute dog, before and after, wrinkly dog before, non wrinkled dog after. And it's kind of finding a concrete and contrasting way to put across what is essentially a really bland product, right? It doesn't have to be a sexy product to get this to work. The peak end rule. This is this weird thing in psychology where you find that whatever experience you've had, like today, hopefully you'll have lots of positive peaks, whatever experience you have, when you get to the end of that experience, your entire judgment of it will be marked and shaped by the most positive peaks, whether you, you are euphoric or anything like that, and the most horrendous lows, so the high peaks and the low peaks, and also what happened at the end. It doesn't matter how good your community experience is, if you're either giving people really bad lows with, within that kind of experience or a really bad ending, that's going to cover everything. So make sure you give people good beginnings and middles and peaks. Final one. Oh, well, that was just for me. <laughs> Final one. Um, I like doing that sometimes. Uh, scarcity. So, in the 1970s, some American psychologists decided to try to basically test it with their uh, students this experiment. They had two jars of cookies at the front of the auditorium. One was full, the other was exactly the same cookies, but there were many fewer in there. So, like, full jar, 85. For which jar do you think the students rated it as more delicious? Hands up the one with the full jar. I think that's going to be really good. This is fresh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Hands up for the empty jar, or nearly empty jar. Right, why? Because more people wanted them. Yes, we value that which is scarce because we believe that our peers got their first, therefore it's kind of heuristic. If everyone else found it valuable, so will I. It's also why websites like this work. This is a website called Ashiko, which is a limited sale website. I have banned this from my URL list because it was depleting my bank account. I was ending up with loads of junk I didn't need. They use scarcity really simply and really effectively. So if you look at the top left, sorry, top right, you'll have a little uh, icon on the top, and it says the sale ends in four days. 
So you're trying that on Wednesday when you're bored, you've got your snuff at work, it's fine, I've got four days, I've got loads of time. You get the weekend, you've had a couple of glasses of wine, this is and then you go, shit, there's one hour left on this sale, I've got to see if I need anything desperately not to change my life. So you're scrolling down, you're scrolling down, things have been reserved, things have been sold out, oh my god, there's only three items left. You don't even, I don't even know what that is, because like a table is too big to fit anyone's room. So you're thinking, I really need it, and then suddenly it goes reserved in big red letters, shit. Missed out. I have missed out. Someone got it for me. So you're sitting there, desperately refreshing the page. So the poor person who's got that item in their checkout basket and they're not checking out fast enough, they lose the item. So you can buy the thing and then you get it. But it puts you into this really aroused state of urgency, so that you make more. I'm not suggesting you do this, but just if you have the same problem with me, don't go on to these sites because this is what they're doing. All right. The emotional system. Is this pace too fast? Are you okay? Are you good? Excellent. So it's related to the limbic system, it's ancient and automatic, we share it with our animal relatives. It's also why you, why you find the little almond shape bit there, the amygdala, which has been maligned in popular psychology as the seat of fear in the brain. It's also um, active when we're looking for uh, cues as to whether we can trust the people that we're engaged with, and it's also for things that are relevant in our environment. So if you're ovulating, you might look for cues with potential mates, uh, if you're really hungry, cues for burgers, etc. The emotional system is also where you find the thalamus, which is like the grand central station of processing emotions in the brain, and the mental tegmental area, which is the dopamine, well, which is dopamine receptors, which is the thing that gets you to seek out rewards and take risks. So, how does this work online? The first thing is that it is related to empathy, which is related to mirror neurons. Now, the reason this is useful, um, well, I'll go to it in a sec. So, quickly, mirror neurons were discovered by Professor Rizalasi in the University of Palmer in 1992, where they placed electrodes in the brains of these poor little mechanics to look at hand and motor, um, hand and mouth motor actions. And what they found was that when a monkey ate food, the brain activity that they observed was really similar, although sort of much, on a much bigger scale, than the activity that they observed when the monkey was watching the researcher eat. So, scenario one, monkeys eating nuts, brain activity goes in a certain way. Fine. Scenario two, researcher is eating nuts. Monkey looks at research, the brain waves sync up. And you think, well, what's happening here? And they found that about 10% of the same neurons were firing in sympathy with the human action. Does that make sense? So they call them mirror neurons because it's mirroring the action of another. Um, this is also how we do social learning. So, guy on the left sticking his tongue out, little macaque on the right responds in kind. The reason it's useful online, especially when you're trying to connect with people, is because it's become, well, it is, the foundation of society, it's a building block of human interaction. Um, and it allows us to understand the positions of others, so to mind read, mind read and create more meaningful interactions. Um, it's also why videos like this are so compelling. I'm sorry, chaps. website, Belmont Marie Folio, uses imagery really well. 
We tend to move towards that which we like and feel comfortable with and away from that which is frightening or we dislike. So in boardrooms, you'll often find, if you're on swivel chairs, that if someone's saying something that people like, people will blade and towards that. As soon as they say something a bit more contentious, you play away. So, the way to direct positive attention through visual cues on a website, you have your main call to action, well, it's kind of the, the message, get anything you want. She's blading towards that, she's open, she's smiling, her head is lifted, the eye gaze is pointing towards it. So all those social cues are pointing you towards that message. And then you have the arrow with a call to action. Um, incidentally, underneath, you've got another congruent message, so the text and the visuals need to match up and be aligned. So she looks pretty overwhelmed, the text above says, how to use social media so it doesn't overwhelm your life. So make sure that you're strategic in your image use. Storytelling is also a great way to engage the emotional system. How many of you guys know Maze Brand? All right. So these guys do it so well. Corduroys, I don't know if you have this in the, in the US, but in, in the UK, corduroys are really unsexy. It's like what job would be My dad's a physics teacher, hence the Star Trek connection. But they wear these things. You're not going to get laid if you wear them. Well, maybe you will. These guys have made it sexy. So instead of doing corduroys that go down, they have the stripes so they go across. And you start to realize that they're telling this in a bit of a weird way. You see that they've got like an evil eye pocket. And you're thinking, is that really a tailoring term? And then you scroll down. And you see that they've got this kind of statement that says, Core rounds mesh evenly, lowering the average wearer's crotch heat index, C H I, every day. <laughs> By up to 22%. Guys, did you know you have a CHI? <laughs> no, of course you don't. I mean, unless you walk around with a down in pants, which I highly don't recommend, I highly doubt. The point is they're creating a weird story around something which is quite banal. Different ways to do the same thing. Also, images of faces. We scan our environment for cues for connection. This is another way to engage the emotional system. How am I doing for time? Good? All right. Finally, the rational system then. It is thought that the rational system is unique to humans. I don't believe this to be true. A couple of years ago, there were some um, people who got inspired in Cambridge University who wanted to create a cetacean bill of rights. So peoplehood for things like whales and dolphins. But they don't use the internet, so it's kind of a big point. Anyway, rational systems to do with your higher cognitive functions allows us to plan and organize and problem solve. It's where you find the seat of much of our social learning and innovation and where we have our language and abstract thought online. Now this bit's really important. How many of you like to think that you're rational? I'm, a, I'm in, the, in the sciences, I like to think that I'm rational. Do you like to think that we like it? Now, how many of us believe that we actually are? Some of us? Okay, yeah, it's debatable. We like to think that we are. The problem is that we're really not. Of all the information that you're taking in right now, 99.9999% of all the information you're taking out now is processed subconsciously. That's a shit ton of information, so you're not even aware that you're processing. <laughs> so this idea that we're rational, I know it's got Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, we have such a, a limited attentional bandwidth that most of the decisions we make online are made in a primal and emotional systems, and we post-rationalize those decisions later. So this is the key thing here. You have to enable your customers to post-rationalize the actions that they've already made, or the decisions that they've already made. Great example, Nasty Girl, one of uh, your exports again, they do this really well. So under the guise of product demonstration, they have uh, a system in which, as a customer, you can take a picture of yourself wearing this item, you send it into them, and they say, yes, you look hot enough to be one of our models, we'll post you up. Straight away, they get validation, they get social, sort of, social proof to their peers, oh, 10 of my friends are doing it, I should also buy into it. This is the platform that they use. Um, so another way to product demonstrate, again, same thing, getting people to show instances in which they're going about their lives and they're using your item or they're using your service. This bit's an interesting one. So listing specifications of product benefits. How many of you do a lot of research before you buy expensive things? All right, keep your hands up if you're female. <laughs> keep your hands up if you're male. Right now, okay, this might be a slightly different sample. So typically, um, in research, you find that there are research differences between kids as young as the age of seven. So seven-year-old males will exhibit more research behaviors online than females, generally speaking, and personality differences notwithstanding. So if you get someone who's highly conscientious, like my dad, he will sit there and, and spend hours going through this kind of information to see what the specifications are. Now, you don't want to overwhelm people. It's the same thing if you've got like a teaser page on a community forum or whatever it might be. You want to give people who are there to just have a quick understanding, a brief outline. Don't over overwhelm them. But provide tabs for those who actually do want to dig deeper. Um, a couple of things that are going on here. Usually this is interactive, but I don't want to take up too much time. So 
some friends of mine who are researchers in the Netherlands were testing how to list product benefits. And they had the idea that if you basically find out what are the top five USPs and you test it against a mix versus the, the worst five, then the top five should perform best, right? They found very little difference. What they did find, and this will annihilate your view that we are rational, what they did find was that the biggest uptake in sales, or the lift in sales, happened when they changed the bullet points into check marks. That's not rational. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other things that are doing on this page. So we tend to choose little options. They're using permissive language, so nothing around payment. It's things like upgrade, pro, free, etc. Only oh, other thing that they're doing. You might not have signed up to Hootsuite already, but it says current plan, so it's as if you've already made that choice. It's idea of commitment. Give evidence that it works. Um, I'm going to show you this three minute video, and I want you to tell me what site principles you think they're using and whether it's effective. Excuse me, so it's based working. Yeah, thanks. Time for a quick check. Hello. Bacteria. Why brush this morning? Not with Colgate Total Toothpaste. Bacteria are the cause of most common dental problems. Only Colgate Total is clinically proven to protect non-stop against all these eight problems. Try it and come back tomorrow. Let's see. Wow, where's all that bacteria? I'm impressed. New Colgate Total. No other toothpaste offers more complete protection for a healthier mouth. Colgate Total, the number one toothpaste brand used by dentists. All right, what's some of the slight things that they were using? Checkbox, yes. Could you read them? Was it too, was it slow enough for you to read one? They were, no. Like, oh my god. What else did they have? What was the evidence? The reason she was smiling, yes. She was smiling, what else? Visualization. When was the last time you went to a dentist and they got out their Harry Potter magic wand? <laughs> like, it doesn't happen. It's not real. It was, so there were the check marks. They were red. They came up, down too quickly. You felt like you couldn't read it. There was a dude standing that rushed. Okay, New Yorkers and Londoners, we get this. A rush out. Are you really going to stop to chat with some weird bloke who pretended to be a dentist in a weird outfit with a wand by a stand talking about bacteria? It's just, it's completely ridiculous. So this is to show you that there are ways in which you can apply these principles that just don't work. You have to have an understanding of how to apply them. Um, be the authority. I'm not going to show you this video because we're limited on time, but um, you know the brand Clinique? Yeah. So it's a cosmetics brand. The name Clinique, it's like clinic. So they've got these little lab coats that they wear. And researchers found two separate really weird things for lab coats. If you get a group of people to wear a lab coat, and you tell them it's a lab coat versus in the second condition where it's an artist's smock, they will create a problem, well, do creative problem solving more efficiently and get better results than the artist's smock. Exactly the same item. Um, also, if you show people adverts, like you guys get this in the States, I'll never forget, the George, like, there's a George Clooney advert or like a doctor where it's an actor who's not an actual doctor and they're selling you medical stuff. Rationally, you'll say that's George Clooney. But because you've seen him in the ER, you have a schema for believing that he's a doctor and he's not more credible. This stuff just happens. It's um, one of these things. Okay, case study, TripAdvisor. First of all, you've got um, a racing system. You can see at the front, it's a face. You're going to be scanning the faces anyway. Straight away, you can see that it's active community members and it's what travelers are saying about London. Now, if you're on the site, you are a traveler because my IP shows I'm in London, it's relevant to me. So it's reflecting my needs. Now, Top bit, your friends. They don't say Facebook, they're saying your friends. Your friends are on here. You want to feel like you're part of the tribe. So you click on there, see where your friends have traveled. Do you think that's really your Facebook page? It's not your Facebook page. But the thing is, because you know that there are faces and you can't access it, and it's just a click away, you want to go there anyway. So it's getting you to nudge into these directions. Once you've done that, you decide that you want to see your friends, you see where they've traveled. I haven't actually done that because I don't like to use Facebook. To get data, they also make it really relevant, relevant and they use language that's most likely to engage your emotional system. So you and yours, what's your story to get you to engage? They then show you how you're stacking up against your peers. So if you're someone who likes to think that you're quite different, you'll go, well, I wonder how different I am to my peers. Or if you're more conformist, you might think, well, how do I conform with my group? Finally, to get you to take action, they limit your choice. There's this kind of misnomer. We like the idea of having choice, the freedom to make a choice. But if you give people more than about five or six choices, they won't act. So it's a question of limiting choice, making people feel like they have a choice, and doing it by chunking things like this. Um, indeed, okay. The other thing, strokes of authority, not just lab coats, but things like, you know, the, the Cannes Film Festival. They have awarded themselves, they made up an award that they did for their own site. No one's given them this award. They made this shit up, and then eventually they told the to people. So they're like providing authority for themselves by giving this thing to other people, and then suddenly they create this thing where there is a stamp of authority. Um, well, anyway, it, it works. 
Um, and then finally, once you've clicked on the Facebook thing, the icon at the top changes again to get that kind of impulsive uh, reaction. And they're showing you what's trending. And this page refreshes again and again, so the bucks are going up and up. And of course, it's that urgent state again, and must see what's going on, what's trending. Okay, I hope that wasn't too quick of a wisdom stop tour. I usually do that in an hour. Um, but here's the key takeaway: if you want to be persuasive online and in e-commerce and in communities and in anything that you might think to do, you have to target all three systems. So you have to make sure that all your messaging and your content and your website is targeting the primal system, so it's arousing. Remember, that's things like sex and food and emotion. You then have the emotional system, so making sure that it's emotionally effective and engaging stories, faces, um, creating a wider positive impact, telling a narrative. And finally, the rational system, making it intellectually compelling so that people can post-rationalize the decisions that they've already made at a primal and emotional level. Um, these are my references, uh, and you are very welcome to take a couple of questions if you have. Thank you.